Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're coming back after a long time. Uh, so let's just begin with a word of prayer and we'll uh, get into our class today. Right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us together. We thank you for your grace, for your mercies, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord, your faithfulness over each of our lives, God. And even as we just come together to sit at your feet and learn, God, we thank you for all that you have taught us uh, through this course. And even as we've come, come to the end of this course, Lord, I pray, God, that you will, Lord, the deposit in our heart, Lord, will bear fruit in our lives, Father. We thank you. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. All right. So uh, this class will be the last class. Uh, and uh, so what, what I thought we'll do is we'll just do a quick review of what we did uh, from the first, uh, uh, the ministry of the evangelist, the teacher, and the pastor. But before that, uh, in the last page, at page uh, of, of it's page twenty in my textbook, in my notes. Is it page twenty? Right. So uh, I know we went through the responsibilities of a pastor, but here there are general responsibilities. We'll just go through them, right? And after that, we'll just do a quick review, and then we we'll close our course for this semester. Right? And you can always feel free to, uh, you know, post questions. Um, and I, I know the e-learning students have posted quite a lot of questions, and I was very happy to see that. So, uh, yeah, I'm answering all of those questions. Thank you for those questions. All right, so let's do this. General responsibilities go faster, and then we'll do a quick review and close this course today. Okay, so general responsibilities of a pastor. Now we looked at the responsibilities both that was spiritual and practical responsibilities now remember when we look at the bible jesus and even in the old testament we look at the bible there is so much of spiritual but it's all aligned to being practical also right uh, i was reading genesis 26 is such a powerful chapter right uh, you can read it in your free time uh, but this this whole thing of the scriptures being spiritual is also need to be put on into practical. Now, if we start a church, we start a ministry. Uh, next, uh, you know, for the third years, I'm teaching urban church planting, and so we learn more about how to plant churches, plant ministries, right? So there are these general guidelines that we will have to do, and we cannot escape it. Right? We cannot say, "Hey, I don't like this. I don't want to do it." No. Uh, one of the things that for me personally was I, I learned the hard way. I said, okay, I have to do this. I have to make sure that these things are done. If I don't do it, the entire church or the team is affected. Right? Okay, let's look at them. General responsibilities. Pray and grow in the relationship, in your relationship with God so that what is undertaken by the congregation reflects in the leading of God. I always say this. Uh, there's a cost to the anointing. Yes, there's a cost, meaning it's not an amount that we pay, but there's a price that we have to pay. Right? If God is calling us to be pastors and leaders, we are also called to be set apart. We are called to spend more time in his presence, more time in God's word. It is a duty. It's a responsibility. We have to do it. And it says here that when our relationship with God is strong, it begins to reflect in your public ministry. It will reflect, right? So spend more time. Your the number one responsibility of a pastor is not the church. It is. It is not. Okay, are there five hundred people in the church? Are there you know life groups in the church? All of that is part of it, but number one responsibility is your relationship with god out of that will flow everything else now what i've noticed and what i see is people are more focused on the way on the you know the vision or the calling that people have now that's good but if the focus is more towards that the relationship will go down I always remember as you grow up in ministry you get more and more and more and more busy and it's very easy for us to get busy doing things 
and our relationship with God is kept aside. Right? Number one responsibility is to spend time in God's presence. Have a relationship with Him. Now, I really like the word relationship because relationship is not only asking. I want this, I want this. No. It's also about God speaking. God ministering to us. God speaking into our life. Right? And this will reflect in the congregation. People in your congregation will notice, they will realize, they will accept you, they will catch the vision that you have, they'll walk with it. Right? And uh, I really wish that, you know, maybe sometime you guys can come to uh, even our locations, which are at ABC East and North, South, East, West. It's, it's wonderful to see, you know, a congregation, people in the church just hold on to the vision. Right? Many of them in our congregations don't know people at Central. Right? They don't know um, the you know congregation at Central, but they're so cl close to the vision. Hey, we are salt and light. Mm -hmm. right? Even though we are far away, we may not even know. And maybe once a year we meet for a church camp. But hey, we are salt. And light. One one church, APC, one vision, right? and people catch it. Right. Two is focus on his family's welfare to ensure that they are cared spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Remember, we talked about this. We looked at three episodes. What are the three episodes? Ah, First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus. And we looked at the responsibilities of a pastor, an overseer, as a leader. Right? He should be able to look after his family. If he's not able to look after his family, how can he look after church? Right. So we should never be in a place where we are saying, okay, uh, I'm looking after the church. God, you look after the family. God will say, stop the church. <laughs> look after your family first. Right. And if you go, especially in rural areas and in villages, they have the whole mindset that God, I'm doing God's work. So God will look after my children. God will look after my family that is that's true but it's also not true because when god told adam he said, put him in the garden he said what you look after you tend the garden and now he's saying you look after your family you look at all through the book of proverbs he says train up a child the way you should go god is not going to come and train the child we have to do it children are like quivers in our uh, in our uh, uh, quivers in our uh, in our basket. Children are like uh, olive shoots in our garden. We have to look after them. Right? Three, seek God's vision for the church. Be the primary vision caster and you'll learn more about uh, the vision and how to pioneer a church next uh, next year in urban church planting. It's really interesting how you plant a church, the starting phase, the pioneering phase, the developing phase, and the building phase and all that. Uh, so, But you seek God's vision for the church and cast the vision to the people. Four, oversee the teaching and preaching of God's word. Now, if you are a pioneer and you have started the church or started the ministry, Oversee the teaching and the preaching. Now we talked about this, right? Why is teaching and preaching important? Why is it important? Because people can come up with stories. The stories can be completely out of out of context. Remember the story of uh, the Samaritan, a good Samaritan who comes on the donkey. Remember, I told you that. <laughs> The four legs are the church. So these are all wrong understandings, wrong teachings, and we need to be very careful. So as a leader, you need to check what is being taught in the church, what is being taught in our life groups. Now, there's a reason, again, next year you'll learn about uh, uh, discipleship in small groups. There's a reason all our life groups, right? So we have life groups all across Bangalore. Uh, 39 life groups and all our life groups that meet across Bangalore, everyone discuss the Sunday sermon. They don't discuss whatever they feel like. No. What is discussed is the Sunday sermon. So last Sunday was 
second, first Thessalonians chapter five, right? So they have to discuss that. There are discussion questions that are given. They have to discuss that. It's not like the life group leader say, okay, come on, open the book of uh, first Kings. <laughs> we can't do that. It's not supposed to do that as a leader, right? Because we, why? Because we are overseeing the teaching and the preaching. Now we know, okay, all the life groups are discussing the Sunday service. So there's no, now again, this we learned the hard way. Because people came back and said, hey, life group leader said like this. Life group leader said, this is what God's word is. Or life group leader said that, right? And it didn't make sense. Or it's a wrong doctrine. What happens? They came and asked us. Yeah, so, oh, uh, this is what the life group leader said. So we had to make sure. And so as a leader, we must oversee. Be, be the steward responsible for the administration of the sacraments. What are the sacraments of the church? Sorry? Breaking of bread. Okay. What are the sacraments? What else? Sorry? The Lord's table. Yes. What else? Look, water baptism. Right? Uh, so these are these are all sacraments in the church, things that happen in the church. Uh, in all things, strive to maintain unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now, this is very important. How we are is what our church will become. Is what our people will become. If I am a person who is only gossiping, you will... I will have a church that is only gossip. That's for sure. If I am a person who is only backbiting, I'll have people like that. Right? So says here, strive for the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So always make sure that as a leader, you're bringing unity and peace within the church. Now, you may not like somebody. You may like somebody more, you may not like somebody as much as the other person. It doesn't matter. Our responsibility is to bring unity, to bring oneness. Now, what is discouraging and very disheartening is that usually it doesn't happen in urban settings, but uh, when you know you have some rich people coming into church, they say, Hey, here's your chair and here's your water bottle. And you have a separate place for the Lord's table. And it does happen. Now, what is happening? Division. The others will feel, how come I'm not so important as them? Right? So as a leader, what we set, we have to set it right. And I remember this example. Oh, I, I, we were in Mangalore. And I think I've shared this example once. Oh, we were maybe about 20, 25 people. Now, all of a sudden, one church member, one of our church members, he said, I'm going to invite somebody to church. He is a big builder right, in the city of Mangalore, and he's very rich, right? and he's going to come you know, in a BMW or whatever, so uh, so you be there for him, and, you know, whatever, bring him if he wants to come, let him know. So he came next Sunday, and full, you know, with all the black cops and all of them, they, they had come, and he came and he said, after the service, people came for prayer, right? So they were standing in there. So this person came up to me and said, pray for him first. He has to go. The black cops are waiting. I said, let them be black cops, white cops. <laughs> That's it, man. Let them stand. <laughs> because they all are waiting. So he stood in the line. Now, I knew that he may feel offended. I knew that the person who invited him also may feel offended, but we were only three, four people. It was not like there were like you know, 20 people signing. Three, four people. I understand that okay, you know, he's rich and very busy, you know, but it's a Sunday. He can stand. But you know what happened after that? He came up to me and he said, I really appreciate what you did. Because others will run and come. And you knew, and that's what I wanted. I didn't want that special attention. So we just became good friends. He would, he would 
come, we would uh, we would minister. He would come for our um, Bible study. He would come for our Wednesday prayers. He would come. I would tell him, you park the car somewhere else, and you come. Don't worry. Nobody will notice you. Because he's quite famous in the city. So he did that. He told me, wear one cap, and he just come. So he came. But what happened was, the church members, they were very happy. He said, hey, we are all equal. So imagine, all of them are equal. And all are sitting together for Bible study. All of them get the same tea. All of them get the same biscuit. No difference. So that initially itself, in the mind, the church members were, hey, everyone are equal. It doesn't matter who comes. So it happened again. And some of the church members invited people. And the church members said, you'll have to wait no matter what. They themselves said, what to wait? Right? So what's happening? You're setting the example. And you learn more about it in church planning, right? Raise up God's people into leadership of his church, equipping, empowering, and supporting them in their God-given ministry. Raise up people into leadership. The day you start your ministry is the day you must think about your exit. Right? The day you start, you must think, hey, I'm not there, who's going to take it up? Right? Raising up leaders is the greatest gift that a leader can have. Jesus did it, the Apostle Paul did it. And good leaders raise up other good leaders. Right? So that's a very important responsibility of the pastors. Right? Never look at ministry as a one-man show. It can never be done. No, it can be done till the church is 10, 15 people. Even then, you can't be doing PPT and then uh, preaching them. You need somebody, even if you're 10 people. But as your church grows, 50, 60 people, you will need volunteers. You will need leaders in the church. So when you look at people, look at them, look at their gifts, look at their callings, look at how you can use them, right? Give them opportunities. Give them open doors for them. Right? Put them in, there will be times, you know, you'll have to push them. Put them in the water. Make them walk. And they will do it. It happened to me, and I'm grateful for that. Man, what do I do? I don't know how to lead worship or I don't know how to preach. I was just pushed into the water. You learn on the job training. Right? So it's good when you when you raise up leaders, you push them. Right? That's why in the supernatural hour I get somebody to sing with me. All of you get a chance. So you get used to it, right? So over time you just learn, you learn, you learn. I don't know, after some time you I'm sure like you know, you'll be able to lead two, three hours. I'm sure you're able to do it now, but you'll be more confident, you'll be more, uh, you know, your, your relationship with God is stronger. So raise up people into leadership. <laughs> Supervise the other staff of the congregation to keep the ministry uh, aligned with a vision. Now, again, we'll learn more on this when we get to urban church planting. Uh, but as your church grows, you will have to build teams and you will also have to have full-time staff right because you cannot have volunteers doing everything right so for example if a church is growing up to 50 60 and you're reaching 100 you will need an administrator you will need why because the administrator has to look at many things one is uh, the funds that come in or if you're booking venues conferences right? maybe one or two people initially Right? And then eventually you grow. So you will have a full fledged staff. And so I remember when NPC were about eight of us initially. Right? And now, now we are so many people joined the team because there's a need. right? And even as that need grows, we ensure that all of them, all our staff, all your staff are in one mind, in one accord. They're all flowing with the vision of the church right so one of the ways that we do it is we have staff meetings right? we have pastoral team meetings we discuss and right? we put forth ideas strategies all of them put it so the publication team give an idea the media team gives an idea and then the sound and setup team gives another idea worship team so all the teams put in our ideas we do like something called as a SWOT analysis something like a SWOT analysis right and we come up with plans and uh, you know how to get better in what we are doing, right? So 
uh, supervise your staff. Now, supervise means don't be looking at them continuously. What you're doing? Why did you? Why did you go for a break? Why? How long was your break? Don't do that. Right? Just give them freedom. But then you're you're ensuring that they are in line. You know, they're doing what has been asked for, of them, and they are able to uh, you know work and perform well. I provide spiritual direction for the daily operation of the congregation, right? This is very important. Now, as your congregation grows 100, 200, uh, you need to be able to provide spiritual direction. So, for example, two of them come and say, I want to start a life group, right? but there's nobody over here in this area. What will we do? We help them. Okay. Maybe let's pull up the database. Let's say who's there. If nobody's there, it's all right. So, we will, what you can do is, Two of you meet, or you can you can meet online. See if you can get a group together. Something you're providing direction. You're giving ideas. You're giving strategies. Right. So, for example, also conferences. Right. So when we plan conferences, we plan it in a way that you know December we don't have many conferences. Why? Because we know that everyone are probably traveling back to their hometowns. Right. Christmas is a time when you know you can do a lot of events, but we don't do conferences. We just do events within the church, right? So, so provide spiritual direction in that way. Um, be responsible for Christian counseling or referral to other Christian counseling agencies. Now, as a pastor, people will come and ask for counsel. This is one area where I really learned so much. Right? And for that, I went back to God's word. I realized in my initial days that I can't just give some random answers. Because people are coming, you know, they have life issues. And they're coming to you because they trust you, because they want some kind of a help. Right? And if I say, you know, don't worry, God is with you, that's not the answer. Right? So to get back into God's way. This is the source of our wisdom. And at the right time, in the right way, God, the Holy Spirit will minister to us to help us to give us give them right counsel. Right? I can share so many instances where uh, people have said, you know, maybe uh, one. I'll give you one instance where this young boy was part of our church, and he was saying, you know, I'm very sad. He's he's going through a season in his life, just feeling very lonely and depressed. Um, I don't like social media. I don't. I don't want to do anything. I just want to be at home. What can we tell? If I go out, uh, people don't like me, or I don't like people. I feel lonely. Uh, college, a lot of friends. I have a lot of friends, but I still feel lonely. What can we do? What What can we say? Hey, don't worry. Go and pray. God will fill your heart with His love. We can say that, but it's not going to serve the purpose at that time. So we must understand what to speak, when to speak, how to speak, what we need, the word of God to minister to them. Right? And over time, there are some counseling that need, sometimes you need professional counseling. So it goes over months uh, of professional counseling. Right? But when it is in your ability, please go ahead. Right? So for example, uh, you know, people come up to me and say, you know, my children are like this. Uh, I need your help. I'm able to help them because that's somewhere that I, I'm, I'm going through it or I've learned. Uh, but if there are, you know, older senior citizens who come and say, you know, these are the challenges, I'm able to help them through God's word. I'm able to give them something, uh, but it becomes more real when it's anointed with the word of God, right? So depend on God's word in everything. Look to God, and over time, you see when uh, when you start your ministry, people will come up to you and ask you questions. Um, you know, the Holy Spirit will put the right word into your mouth. He will do it, and and you see, people will be blessed. People themselves say, "Hey, because because you know, the Pastor said this, His word touched my heart. His word ministered to me. Because of that." I'm able to stand up again. And you'll realize that, hey, it's not about me. It's the word that you have spoken. right? So be able to uh, give good counsel. Now, over time, see, I do understand that, you know, we, as a church grows, as pastors, we'll be busy. Right? So something that we have 
is uh, one is the Christmas counseling, and two is something that we recently started called the life coaching. Right, so we have life coaching leaders across in our, all our locations. So, so for example, if I am in need of uh, spiritual growth or uh, you know, a marriage and family or uh, parenting, whatever it is, so I can I can be connected to a life coach who will speak into my life. He's he or she has gone through that whole season. They've, or for example, if somebody if, if it's about workplace, right? So somebody who's in the IT and in the workplace, uh, gone through, done most of their life in the corporate world. So they speak into our life, right? So these are two areas that we are trying to do. And of course, as pastors, when people come and uh, speak to us, we give them godly counsel. So over time, when you start ministry and you start your church, you can always have teams, you can have people who can uh, you know, provide godly counsel. But you need to make sure that uh, you know, they're probably trained in that. Right? And finally, conduct services, that is weddings, funerals, all the other practical things uh, that has to be done. Uh, you should be available for that as well, right? So uh, I know we did it quite a lot in this uh, entire course. So I just repeat the assignment, and then uh, we'll see, quickly do a review and we close, right? Okay, I'll post the assignment on classroom. Sorry, I missed to do that, but I'll do that. So the assignment is you can choose one teacher or one evangelist, one pastor, alive or gone to be with the Lord. Doesn't matter. But what I want you to do is gain insights from their ministry, from their life. So, for example, uh, you're choosing a pastor, right, or a teacher. So you're talking to a teacher, you say, okay, hey, uh, how did you know that you were called to be a teacher? Right? And if it's somebody who's not, who's gone to be with the Lord, but if it's somebody who is uh, you're checking online, read about them, right? read about what they did, how God called them, how they figured out, okay, this is what I want to do. Right? Just, just learn from them, right? So for example, if you look at Billy Graham, his first few meetings, nobody came. Right? There were some 10, 15 people who came. How many? 10 people came for his first right? First few meetings. But how did he know that this his was his uh, calling and how did he flow in that? So you can just read, right? Try to understand what happened to him. How 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 was it? How is his ministry so success, successful, right? How did he become so powerful as a leader? What is his daily habits? What did he do, right? Uh, what are the areas he could have done better? You can just write about it, right? So if it's a one-page description also, it's all right, right? Uh, and then you choose an evangelist, you choose a pastor, you write about that, right? And that will be your uh, marks. But even as you write now, don't just read copy paste the whole thing and pay. <laughs> I don't do that, right? You can write in your own words if you want, right? You want you write it in a piece of paper, write it in paper, take a photo, post it on the classrooms. It's more meaningful that way if you feel, or if you just want to type it out on a word doc and send it, it's fine. Okay? Words, huh? There's no minimum, there's no maximum. Minimum is... 10 words, <laughs> maximum is not more than 500, because I won't read it, <laughs> it's too much. Right. Okay, so uh, let's just quickly go through this uh, entire book. So firstly, we looked at the five-fold ministry. Now I want each one of you to share your thoughts. What are the five-fold ministry? Those online also can share. What is the five-fold? Apostle. Yeah, I trust you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, what is the fivefold ministry for? So one of the things that we looked at was on, in the first chapter, three things. The the fivefold ministry was to so that all of them will continue in the unity of the faith, will come to the knowledge of God, will come to the perfect man, full measure of Christ. Which means this. I ministry was given 
for the body of Christ, for the for the growth and the benefit of the body of Christ. So even as we serve, always keep the body of Christ, the church, the ministry in your mind. You're not doing something for yourself. You know, we are not building our own kingdoms. We are not building our own ministries. Yes, it can be. But the bigger picture is it's God's kingdom. You're raising up people to be like Jesus. That is the goal that we have. How do we do that? Through all these events, programs, all of that, right? So uh, the, uh, there is an anointing for each ministry gift. We looked at that, right? So there is gifts and there is function. So many people can function as evangelists, prophets, right? Pastors, teachers, but there's a gift also, which God gives. Okay, you are going to be an evangelist. You are going to be a pastor, right? So there's a ministry function, ministry gift. But for both, it is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And you've got to depend on that. Then we went and we looked at the evangelist. Jesus is our example. He was empowered. He, he had a different varied audience. His message was always repentance, forgiveness, love, the kingdom of God. His methods, preaching, teaching, followed by signs, wonders, and miracles. He traveled around. Uh, he faced challenges. There was unbelief. People had, uh, there were demonic encounters, oppositions from other leaders and he also was supported by people right and then we looked at very importantly the evangelist in the early church right philip was uh, first called the evangelist he preached in all cities and then we also see the apostle paul uh, functioning as an evangelist right although his main gift his ministry gift was that of an apostle to go out plant churches and keep moving about but he also functioned the, in the evangel as the evangelist we briefly looked at the restoration of the ministry of the evangelist so uh, god raised up people george whitfield uh, john and charles wesley uh, dl moody the healing evangelist of the early 80s and 90s um, uh, or dl osborne renard bonke Benny him all of these uh, and then teddy evangelist right then keys to doing the ministry so we see there, we follow the biblical pattern, develop the supernatural, develop the ability to present the gospel, maintain a passion for souls, right? That's important. Uh, ministry can get bore, boring. Say. If we don't maintain our hard attitude, ministry can get, oh, another day, another 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. class. Uh, it can get, so we need to stir up. I keep maintaining a passion for Jesus, passion for people, a passion to serve, right? Uh, because that's what the enemy, what does he do? He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to steal the joy. So we need to be on our guard at all times, right? Uh, and as a teacher, Jesus was so powerful. He, he preached, he taught in wisdom. He used three things, right? Three common ways of uh, teaching, what were they? One was metaphors, which was figures of speech, hyperboles, which are exaggerations, and then he used parables. And so even in our teaching, uh, you can use these uh, three methods or three avenues of bringing in uh, your examples or your, your teaching method. You can use these three areas. Right? Then we looked at the teacher in the early church. Uh, and there are some of the some stern things that we looked at do and then teach teach the commandments uh, the holy spirit is our teacher develop the ability to teach well always teach true doctrine stay away from false doctrine develop the ability to understand scriptures in light to the context right so you're studying the scriptures there are some things that you may not understand stay over there pray ask god to give you the wisdom go online get different thoughts understand and make sure that what you're teaching is a right theology right that's very important right ensure sound doctrine teach with the wisdom of the holy spirit 
wisdom, applying your knowledge, what you've learned, apply it, teach it with the wisdom, right? Then we looked at practical keys of doing the ministry of a teacher, that is to develop a wide range of topics. Don't say, we cannot say, I don't like uh, history. You may not like, but you got to go back to history. And it's, it's a, if, you're studying, if you're teaching Old Testament, so you have to go back to history. Or, uh, or you have to go back, and what about geography? You have to understand the places, what is there, the cultures, so many things, right? So develop this range of being able to uh, minister and to learn and develop yourself in all areas. Right? One of the areas that I really enjoyed was faith and science. Remember the series of faith and science? Right? So I was really enjoying it because science is not my strong subject. But the moment I began to, because I knew I had to preach, so I went and did a lot of studies and I, I was so happy that I could learn and because uh, I don't know everything yet, but there's so much that I understood that faith and science series. And so develop that ability. Don't look at something and say, oh, this is boring. I don't want to learn. Right? You, you, you tell yourself, hey, I want to learn this. Right? Uh, it may not be exactly related to scriptures, but it is something that you, if you have to learn, learn it. Right? Practice before you teach. Keep revelation fresh. Stay fresh in the word of God. He tells you, read Matthew chapter 5. Don't say, oh, I already know Matthew chapter 5. Uh, Sermon on the Mount. I, I know the whole sermon. Right? Read it again. When you read it again, keep it fresh. God will minister. Right? Now, especially when you go to the Old Testament also. There's so much to learn. And so keep your revelation fresh. Stay fresh in the word of God. Right? If there are places where you feel, okay, you're not understanding, not learning, go to places that you can learn. Right? So, for example, you've been studying Old Testament. Take a break. Go to the New Testament. This is what I do. Right? So, just go back to the New Testament. Read something that you're encouraged. And then go back. Right? The Bible is not going to run away. It's going to be there. You can always come back. Right? Come back, study it. And, and, and one good habit as a teacher is to make notes. Right? When you when you are preparing, make notes, make bullet points, make notes. So when you're teaching, you know, okay, this is the point I should give here. Right? And you learn this in homiletics, in well, did homiletics, right? So yeah, so uh, so make notes, very important. Right? So you know, okay, as I'm teaching, this is what I will say here. This is the point I can use here. This is the example I can use here. Uh, and, and these are the questions I can ask my students. Be prepared, right? Uh, then we looked at the pastor. All through the Old and the New Testament, you see the pastor as the shepherd, the chief shepherd. The shepherd, we talk so much about it. The shepherd is the one who protects, who speaks, who knows. He, he leads. He is willing to give his life for his sheep. The shepherd knows. The sheep, the, the, the sheep, and the sheep know the shepherd's voice. We are his sheep. We are to know our chief shepherd's voice, right? Then we also looked at the responsibilities and rewards of the pastor. We looked at those three epistles: Timothy, First and Second Timothy, and Titus. Right? So, I want to encourage each one of us, and right? uh, even as we close this course. Um, Whatever God has called you to do, right, give it your best. Give your heart, your soul, give everything that you have, and the Lord will bless what you do. Number Another important point is don't compare your ministry and your calling to somebody else's. It may look nice, it may look exciting, but if God has called you and you know that God has called you for a certain thing, be faithful there. Right? And give all that you can. Give your best. If you're young here, right? You have a you have your entire life ahead of you, right? And so just give all that you can. Go back to the world. Dive into this world. Spend time in the world, right? 
now you know I, I really when we were like when I became a believer and I was learning I didn't have access to Google and all that it was not as much as what we see now right but now you have so much when you go to Google and you just type in you know uh, uh, if you type in like concordance or a Bible study you'll you get for verses you get a study you can learn so much from it right? Bible study tools so many Bible study tools are there right sermon central and there are so much right can learn right? so it's all about the now it's now it's available it's all about us using it right so I want to encourage each one of you step out on your calling even as you step out depend on the anointing of the Holy Spirit when you depend on that every day you'll wake up there'll be times you'll be high there'll be times you'll be low feel oh what's happening but God will enable you to press on his anointing his presence will lead us right so uh, we close this post thank you for joining those who are online thank you so much um and i will post the post notes on uh, sorry the, the assignments online um, with a due date so you can take your time and do it um, i really enjoyed teaching this course and i learned so much uh, i'll see you at the next semester shall we just close with a word of prayer i request one of the students if he can please pray and close anyone right. We thank you for this um, time that you have and that we gather together and we can learn uh, so much more um, about your word, about the, about the church, and how as um, leaders help us and ourselves. I want um, to pray that uh, we will not. Uh, Forget what we learned and the important part of us from all has put it to us. I pray that the same elements can slip into our hearts. I pray that we study that we study as a sort of background and that we will remember we will be all but we can talk and that we can be able to find our lives. In Jesus' name, it's time for you to be able to help. Let's most of all the things that are teaching us and that is this is a great event. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good week and have a good time. I'll see you next semester. God bless you all.